Hi guys, good evening and welcome to Editor's Roundtable. It was a week of turmoil in the financial space. The Sensex and the Nifty end down with a cut of 2%. Will we see a recovery next week? Thank you for joining in to Editor's Roundtable. I am Reema Tendulkar. Joining me is Prashant, Nimesh and Mangalam. Hi guys, I think we can all <laughs> heave a sigh of relief. Right? Uh, that, the the, that the week is over. That the, the week, week is, is over. The news flow <laughs> But never the weekend is ahead of us. Okay. And if last weekend is any indication, this one could be action packed as well. Although, I mean, we don't have to report on it at least, right? Yeah. Not on Saturday or Sunday. But these guys have some exciting plans. Cricket, I'm I, I believe. Cricket. I'm going to go and watch the match there. So, after this show, I, I just want to rush to the match. Yeah, so same, same here. I, I'll, I, I'll hitch a ride with you. <laughs> because there's no parking outside. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to watch the match. You're going to sleep on your couch. Yeah, absolutely, Rima. But what a week we've had, right? Eventful. Uh, eventful and uh, I would say historic, right? Yes. I, I, you know, actually, let me just go across to the big wall and uh, tell our viewers uh, what the week was all about. Because this is, uh, you don't see weeks like this very often. Uh, and we did see one. Uh, at the start of the week, this was being compared to Lehman, Bear Stearns, 2007, 2008. Thankfully, it turned out to be nothing like any of those episodes. But I have to say that history was written tick for tick. Let me tell you why. And the story starts last Wednesday. Uh, that is when the, Sil the Silver Silvergate Bank announced that it is shutting down. I mean, actually, that announcement came after US markets shut on 8th of March, which is last Wednesday. Let's move on. Uh, the story moves forward. I mean, the turmoil started. The market started to worry a little bit, but not full-blown. And then you had the Silicon Valley Bank, which failed. It went into FIDC receivership. Uh, that was Friday. Uh, things started to accelerate post that. Uh, uh, move on to the weekend. That is last Sunday. You had the failure of Signature Bank, which went down. These are regional banks, uh, banks as we've been discussing uh, uh, quite a bit. Markets were panicky. We woke up the next morning, Monday morning here, uh, with news, good news, that the U.S. has stepped in to protect depositors. Also, uh, you know, as a consequence of this, all of this financial turmoil which was emerging and uncertainty which was there, Fed pricing, Fed, hike, uh, Fed hikes were priced out of the system. They completely vanished. From 50 basis points four days earlier, we started the week with zero rate hike expectations. Uh, uh, Tuesday, we got core CPI numbers which came in, which were stronger than what was expected. Some of the Fed rate hike expectations were priced back in. Wednesday, uh, you know, the, uh, the worry was passed on from US to Europe. Credit Suisse was the, suddenly the epicenter of all the panic. European markets started selling off in a big way. Thursday, uh, you had uh, Credit Suisse, which took $50 billion from the Swiss National Bank. And the ECB, they, later that evening, hiked interest rates by 50 basis points as well. And this morning, we woke up with news that is Friday that the uh, U.S. bank consortium has put in $30 billion uh, in deposits into FRC. This is a timeline, a tick-by-tick -tick timeline in terms of what has happened over the last one week or so, a little over the last one week. But these are just the highlights, right? I mean, we lived through uh, what went on, the ups and downs, and uh, boy, it was up and down many times over. Now, how has the crisis affected markets? This is interesting. Again, this is uh, price change since the 8th of March close, last Wednesday close. And it's stunning. The S&P is down under 1% for all the troubles, under 1% lower. The Nasdaq is up 1%. The Nifty is down 4.2% with all the distance. The Nifty is the one which actually is taken under the chin. The US two-year yield is down 92 basis points. It was above 5% a week before, a week and a half back. It's now a little over 4%. The dollar index is down 1%. And oil prices have sold off very aggressively by about 10% or so. Now, I just kind of uh, dug in a little bit more uh, in terms of Nifty is down 4, 4.5%, right? And US is up. But how does Nifty compare to other Asian emerging markets? Guess what? Nifty and Sensex are the worst performing emerging markets in this current risk-off episode. Uh, so, I mean, actually, the only market forget uh, sort of emerging or developed, the only Asian markets which has done poorly as compared to Nifty is Japan. That's it. Otherwise, we are the worst off. Uh, and, you know, perhaps well, some of the reason is the FII is selling, right? But there have been so many blocks, so to kind of uh, cancel the noise out, what I did is basically take total DII and FII uh, inflow into the market year to date and subtracted the total amount of blocks which have happened. So the total institutional inflow into secondary markets this year stands at 7,200 crores. That's paltry. That's very, very small. 
Uh, valuations have come off quite a bit. The Nifty one year forward PE now, as of the end of Friday's trade, stands at 17.3 times. The average for the last 15 years is 17 times. But you know, when you look at PE multiples, the discount rate matters quite a bit. And that goes back to talking about interest rates. Direction of interest rates are extremely important. And that will determine uh, you know, uh, what happens to interest rates and hence valuations, et cetera. And to that, uh, in that context, we've got the FOMC, which will be meeting next week. So just thought, I mean, I'll put some of this stuff out. With the amount of volatility we've had, I mean, I have to say that uh, markets are a little volatile. Markets are uh, a little jittery and shaky as well. Uh, and I think it'll take some time before uh, some normalcy, some stability kind of returns. Nimesh, uh, you've been talking to a lot of uh, dealing rooms as well. What are you hearing? You know, Prashant, uh, you, you put out some interesting data. The fact that Nifty was down 4% this week despite global markets, well, there was too much of noise, but they were stable. And that means that, you know, a lot of crucial uh, technical support levels got broken on the Nifty. And that actually led to a lot of fear as well. So the mood is very, uh, very downbeat. Uh, there, it, there is extreme pessimism, so to speak. Uh, when you talk to the dealers or, t or, or like, you know, the larger investors or for that matter, traders as well. So the, the the level to watch now is 16800 on the downside if you look at uh, this week you know twice we sub we, we came to those levels and we rebound from there so that's that's a big support level to watch as far as uh, the nifty is concerned at least in the very near term so that's something to watch out for uh, last week if you remember i, I had suggested that you know the, the, the block deals will continue and we are, we are going to hit five billion dollars before the month of march and in fact it happened this week itself right i mean another billion dollar block deals happened and we've touched over five billion dollars as far as the supply is concerned so and that supply uh, my sense is likely to continue but the big feedback now is that uh, while everybody is watching about block deals uh, my sense is there could be large MLA transaction as well. That's the mm -hmm. that's the feedback from investment bankers that watch out for some large deals, which might happen before the end of uh, this financial closure. So that will be important to track, and that can have an impact on some stocks as well. Uh, I guess uh, you know from a, from a trigger point of view, the Fed meet next week. That's going to be very important. Uh, I guess TT is pr priced in the 25 basis point uh, you know uh, rate rate hike. So if that comes, I guess there will be a bit of a relief rally, so to speak. That's the overall feedback from the dealing room. So that's something to watch out for. The other important thing is, if you look at uh, the mood, uh, at least in the last two days, the feedback was some bit of risk appetite is back, largely from the smart HR investors. So around 16,800, 16,900, some money was put to work by, by the, some large smart HNIs, and the feedback is they are sensing a bit of a pullback post the Fed mid. So that's something to watch out for. But I guess the supply hovering is something that's, good, that's a big niggling factor, and that's likely to continue till the March end. That's the overall feedback. You know, you but Rima, you know, uh, I think uh, mm. most important thing is the banks. You know, that's been a big underperformer. And I think you've yeah. worked on some number on the on the banks as well. Well, absolutely. You know, this week was all about the banks Bank. as people were assessing the health of the global banks in US and Europe. So the big question now, is there a risk for the Indian banks, right? How do they hold up in light of what we are seeing right now? So first, let's take uh, stock of how the banks perform. This week, the Nifty Bank was down 2.2%. The PSU Banking Index slipped 4.5%. And individual names, a Bank of Baroda, a State Bank of India, all took a deep tumble. So we're taking a hard look at the health of the Indian banks and we're evaluating them on three key parameters. The first one is the quality of the liabilities, that is your depositors. Secondly, the yield impact on the investment book. Is there a risk of big losses, the M2M losses on the Indian banks' portfolio, on their bond portfolio, due to the rise in the interest rates? And third, the risk to the asset quality. So the first one, let's talk about the bond portfolio of the Indian banks. Now, CLSA says the Indian 10-year bond yields were at 7.5% pre-COVID, early 2019. They dropped to sub-6% during COVID, but now they rebounded to 7.4%. CLSE's discussions with a few PSU banks suggest that the break-even for an M2M loss for PSU banks is roughly 7.5%. So even if yields go up by another 500 basis points, according to CLSE, the PBT hit is likely to be manageable and at approximately 5 to 7%. So this is on the bond portfolio. Now let's talk about the liabilities, depositors. Is there a risk of a big outflow of depositors? Something that we've seen in the United States and few of uh, the banks like SVB. Now, Jeffrey says that in India, 
household depositors constitute more than 60% of the depositors. Now, these are sticky. They don't typically move to GSEC. So, the concentration risk in India is very low and therefore, the risk on this front is on the lower side. And the third parameter to look at is the asset quality. Now, here, uh, you know, what we picked up is the mortgage rates in India pre-COVID were 8.5%. They fell to 6, 6.5% during COVID, but now they're at levels of 9%. So the increase of EMI rates in India is not as severe as what we've seen in the Western economies. And therefore, the likely hit to asset quality is again likely to be on the lower side. And plus, the bank's asset quality, the kind of buffers, the contingent provisions that they are sitting on is the best that we've seen in over a decade. Banks themselves are not very worried. You know, this week, Morgan Stanley put out a note in the Indian banking system. They met with a lot of financial institutions and their key takeaways are that banks are saying that the loan growth is likely to remain healthy. Yes, there will be some NIM moderation next year as funding costs catch up, but the asset quality remains benign. So banks are not worried. Are the brokerages worried then? So here's a quick roundup of the brokerage commentary. Jefferies, in its note this week, says the SVB test on the Indian, bank, uh, Indian banking sector holds up again. CLSE says negligible contagion risk, no material impact except for heightened risk premiums. And Macquarie says it's Goldilocks with a minor bump. So that's just a, you know, a quick summary of what is the health of the Indian banks based on what's happened globally. We need to slip into a very short break at this point. But on the other side, we'll talk about the top management changes that have taken place this week, the announcements on that front. And we'll also invite Hiren Ved of Alchemy. Welcome back. You're watching us here on the Editor's Roundtable on CNBC TV 18. If there's one thing that the last couple of weeks have taught us, it is that change is the only constant. And there were a lot of management changes that took place across multiple sectors. So, you know, in case you heard those numbers and names on a stray basis, I've compiled all of them. We start with the IT sector and the biggest one that happened on Friday itself, uh, uh, you know, uh, the unexpected resignation of the TCS MD and CEO Rajesh Gopinathan and then his successor K. Kritivasan being appointed as a CEO designate. Of course, he's an old hand at TCS itself, 34 years in the company, heading the BFSI vertical. But that's not the only big change. Uh, we had uh, Tekem announce, finally announce uh, the successor to CP Gurnani as well, Mohit Joshi quit Infosys to join Tech Mahindra as CEO. Of course, this after CP Gurnani's term ends in, uh, uh, in December itself of this year. But you know what it also revealed was Infosys is now turning out to be a bit of a leadership factory because earlier itself we had uh, uh, Ravi Kumar quit Infosys to join Cognizant as uh, its CEO too in October 2022. But let's move away from IT to insurance. Uh, the big mover in trade during the week was ICICI Pro. Thereafter, uh, uh, th this was after Anu Bakchi was appointed as the MD and CEO of the company for five years. Of course, he succeeds NS Kannan, whose uh, term superannuates in June itself. What's interesting is both uh, Bakchi and NS Kannan are uh, ex ICICI ED, so big bankers going into the insurance vertical. And talking about big bankers, well, the biggest insurance company made three announcements. Uh, MR Kumar retired, and Siddharth Monty has been appointed as the interim chairperson of LIC. But apart from that, they also announced appointments of two managing directors, M. Jagannath, as well as Tablesh Pandey, who has replaced BT, BC Patnaik. Now, in case you're wondering why is uh, there one chairman and two managing directors, LIC has the capacity to have four managing directors and one chairman as per the LIC Act of India. But uh, moving on, away from insurance into uh, the financial institutions, banks, Suman Katpalya's term as MD and CEO was extended in, uh, for Indusind Bank. Of course, uh, the board had asked for a three-year extension, but the RBI had granted just two years of exp extension, as a result of which there was a bit of a dip on the stock price. But then again, let's see where that goes. There was a CFO change at Karnataka Bank as well, where Abhishek Bakchi, who was earlier at NSDL Payments, uh, has joined as the CFO. And the biggest one coming in from HUL, the FMCG sector, it was, uh, you know, finally clear that Rohit Java will be leading the company. And this after Sanjeev Mehta hangs his boots after being at the helm of uh, the consumer major for 10 years in a row. And that also proves uh, HUL's leadership factory once again, because we had Prabha Narsimhan join Colgate from HUL uh, way back in April 2022. And a year before that, Sudhir Sitapati 
joined Godrej Consumer from HUL as well. But appointments weren't the only ones. We had a couple of resignations too. Bittu Vergis, who was important uh, in the IPO process of Sula Vineyards, has uh, resigned as the CFO. And Mahindra Life Spaces, the MD and CEO, uh, resigned. And we had Amit Kumar Sinha as the MD and CEO of Mahindra Life Spaces. All of this happening in just the last 10 odd days. Uh, so these were all the big changes. We also welcome uh, Hiren Ved of Alchemy on our show. Hiren, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, these uh, many changes, of course, all these companies are well-oiled machines. Just wanted to know if there is one change that stood out for you and you are betting on the company or looking at differently after uh, a management change? Well, I think, you know, in the case of uh, TCS and HUL, I think it should be business as usual, right? I mean, these companies have a very, very strong bench of managerial talent. These are large companies, well-oiled machines, and therefore there should be no disruption and there should be a reasonable amount of uh, continuation, right? I think usually what is exciting is that if a company, for whatever reason, has not been doing so great within the sector and you do get a new leadership, I think that there is, uh, you know, there is a, a, a point to be considered that things could significantly change in terms of strategy, in terms of performance and so on and so forth. So if you put that perspective, then I think the two most notable ones that I would suggest is one is IPRU, where, uh, you know, uh, Anup Bakchi has taken over as the CEO. Uh, you know, he has had a super track record uh, uh, in ICICI Bank. And I do believe that, uh, you know, that he will certainly be able to make uh, uh, significant changes uh, in the trajectory of growth for IPRU. Uh, obviously, the entire insurance industry is entering some kind of a regulatory headwind with uh, the cap on uh, the tax <coughs> benefits uh, for large policies. Uh, but given his retail uh, experience, I think that there is a reasonable probability that he should be able to bring IPRU into top gear. And the second name would be Tech Mahindra, where I think that they have great capabilities, but both from a margin and growth perspective, I think that there is a clear uh, possibility that uh, things could change for the better. And I think the markets recognize that pretty quickly when these two changes were made, uh, the stocks rallied. Uh, and usually our experience has been that, uh, you know, there is usually a honeymoon for a year when because investors give them a benefit of doubt. There is a hope, there is a certain option value that is built. And then they obviously would want to see the change in performance. So typically they, they do give a thumbs up, uh, they give them a couple of quarters, and then it really boils down to what changes, uh, you know, these new CEOs and leaders make in the respective organization. So from uh, my uh, perspective, I think these two are the most critical. Got that, got that. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, the other important thing is, uh, Hiren, uh, you know, the bank nifty, you know, that's been a big underperformer. While the, while the, while, as Rima also pointed out, it's a Goldilocks scenario for most of the banks. But bank nifty is down 10%, individual stocks are down 15, 20%. And we had a change in Indescent Bank as well. So view an Indescent Bank after the change. And overall on the banking sector, what's the, what's the pecking order there? So I think, uh, you know, with Indescent Bank, uh, in a way, it's good that, uh, you know, there has been a two-year extension. Well, I think... Initially, people ex they had applied for a three-year extension, but they got two years. But two years shouldn't be bad, right? I mean, two years is, is also a reasonable time frame. Uh, I think the sell-off in the banks is largely to do uh, with the risk off. We've seen in the last couple of weeks, because and especially after the SVB uh, uh, you know, bank failure in the U.S., while I think that there is no direct correlation, I think Indian banks are pretty strong. Uh, uh, you know, great deposit franchises, very well capitalized. Uh, 
uh, and so on and so forth. But I think it was more of a risk off, uh, uh, which is being reflected in the bank Nifty. Um, having said that, I think uh, you know also in the sense that these are this is a sector which is fairly liquid. So if people want to hedge or short, uh, you know this becomes a great instrument to do that. Uh, uh, and uh, you know sometimes you just have this mm. global correlation, right? Banks go down everywhere. Banks in India also go down, but I think that that to me looks like a tr yeah, very temporary phase. The only thing that I would say is that uh, typically the banks were benefiting from a rising rate scenario, right? So they typically benefit because the assets get repriced first and the deposits take time to, to reprice. And right. we've seen a superb Goldilocks scenario as far as the NIMS are concerned. Okay. And uh, I think if this, uh, if this is something where the market is sensing that maybe one more just last rate hike from the RBI and then a pause, I think you will see that NIMS more or less would have peaked for the banking sector in India. Mm. Uh, Hiren, wanted to get your thoughts in on the tech sector. At the beginning of the year, your call was that the Indian IT sector is likely to bottom out in the first half of the year. Given the concerns yep. surrounding the US global banks, the possibility of them uh, being capital constrained and therefore going slow on their tech budgets, maybe cutting back, is there a risk to the earnings of IT companies more than what you had anticipated, say, in the month of January, given what we've seen right now? So, Rima, I think, I mean, you cannot wish away the fact that there would be some uncertainty around tech spending, especially with the smaller banks, right? The smaller regional banks uh, and so on and so forth. But we need to recognize that, uh, A, uh, maybe the discretionary part of the spending cut, we do not know as of yet. I don't think even the companies know that. But you know that when something like this happens, the markets typically tend to price in the worst. And then as and when things unfold, uh, you know, either things snap back uh, or, you know, you uh, you kind of then the, 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 the market starts to price in the actual reality, right? But initially, the market typically tends to have a knee-jerk reaction and it prices in the worst. And I think that's what happened in the tech sector, right? But you could also argue that most likely there will be more stricter regulation when it comes to the smaller right. bank and the regional banks. And when that happens, that could actually mean higher tech spending by these banks because we have seen in the past, for example, after the global financial crisis, uh, you know, uh, they, when there was more regulatory mm. and risk management, mm. case, actually there was a rebound in tech spending at that point in time. So maybe there could be a hiatus for a quarter or two, but it may turn out to be a boon in disguise for the yeah. tech sector, in my view. That's an interesting way to look at things. Uh, I think you're referring to Dodd-Frank, right? And I think uh, yes. that benefited uh, financials quite a bit. Uh, Hiren, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much uh, for joining us on this uh, program and look forward to speaking with you uh, soon again. Well, guys, uh, that's it. Finally, that's it. for Finally. the week. Finally. So Colin just to Arash. recap plans, cricket, cricket, cricket. sleep and party, Friends. right? <laughs> <laughs> coffee. <laughs> All right, coffee. You sure it's just coffee, right? <laughs> All right, I think uh, we'll say goodbye. Thank you very much. Have a restful weekend and uh, we will uh, see you back on Monday morning with all the latest action.